I'm delighted to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Jeff Fernie. Dr. Fernie is based at the University of Toronto, where he serves as professor of surgery and has cross appointments in the Institute of Biomaterials, as well as biomedical engineering, mechanical industrial engineering, as well as physical and occupational therapy. In his free time, he's also a professional engineer and institute director for research at the Toronto Rehab Institute. Dr. Fernie is a world leader in the application of engineering to create innovative solutions for problems commonly encountered by persons with disability. And his keynote address will be focused on the promise and the potential of technology. Dr. Fernie. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Jack. And thank you, everyone, for inviting me. Uh, I'm pleased to be here. The process of growing old is one that's uh, associated with many calamities, small and large. Whether we start off with a disability or not, we're going to end up with one, uh, and probably more than one, and a disability that's exacerbated by multiple minor as well as major uh, complications. So I've decided to divide the technologies that I'm going to talk about uh, between two objectives, the first of which I would broadly describe as prevention. Um, the idea that we would all like to avoid as many of those calamities as possible so that we don't need the technology as we grow old seems self-evident. But then I'm in the home of freedom and um, the goal of technologies to ensure that we have our independence and our mobility and our freedom is the other one that I'm going to look at. I'm not very comfortable talking in the abstract. I like to talk with concrete examples. So I've chosen three concrete examples in each of these areas. And the first two are deliberately provocative um, because they may look like medical technologies and not uh, disability-related technologies to you. Um, so let's begin with sleep apnea, and let's indicate why we're concerned. 7%, maybe 8% of adults have sleep apnea. So in this room, which has, what, 100 people, so, but you're all getting on a bit, so let's <laughs> double it. I would reckon there's 15 people in this room with sleep apnea at the moment. Um, if you're prepared to admit it, would you like to raise your hand? One, two, three, four. Four admitting it, five admitting it. Five admitting it. Well, that's interesting because, in fact, only 10% of those that have it have ever been diagnosed. So there's 50 people in this room, probably, with obstructive sleep apnea. Now comes the bad news. Those of you who have it and aren't treating it have three times the chance of a cardiac event, four times the chance of a stroke, a high automobile accident risk. You're costing the healthcare system in Canada if you come up to Canada, and here it would a lot more, of course, but twice as much as anyone else. So this is a big deal. In fact, this is a huge public health issue. So how are we going to avoid these disabilities? Well, the problem at the moment is really this acronym PSG, polysomnography. In order to have a diagnosis officially of obstructive sleep apnea or sleep apnea of any kind, um, you have to go to a sleep clinic and generally, and you have a lot of electrodes attached to you, and then you're told to go to sleep. In Ontario, this costs us 500 bucks. It costs the province 500 bucks. In the United States, it costs you anywhere from 1,500 to 2,000. In some areas in Canada, you have to wait two years to get into a sleep clinic, and no one wants to go. So what we've developed is this technology. There are actually about 14 competitive products on the market. What I'm pleased about with this technology is that we've demonstrated that it is way more accurate than any other and that you can use it at home. And it basically um, it tells you whether you have sleep apnea or not with an accuracy that's comparable to a sleep clinic. It's absolutely dead on the same accuracy. You just take it home, and it listens to the air moving across that mask, that uh, holder. So diagnosis is the first part of the story. Treatment's the next part. 
I'm not going to go into treatment a lot, but you're all familiar with CPAP, constant pressure, air, airway support. You have a fan basically inflating your throat. It used to be thought that when you were asleep, that a fat pad here was pressing and collapsing your throat. We don't think that so much now. We think it's a fluid shift problem, that during the day you're accumulating fluid in your lower limbs, and particularly if you're a man, men have a, women have a protective mechanism, but when you lie down, that fluid moves up, and you can see your ankle diminish and your neck swell. And this has a lot to do with fluid management, so there's a lot of interesting new possibilities for treatment. But diagnosis is the first. So a big area of prevention for disability associated with aging particularly is sleep apnea. The next one, we like to think of ourselves living in the community as we grow older, but we do have to go to institutions sometimes. Um, that does happen. And unfortunately, when we go into an institution in North America, one in 10 of us will come out with something that we didn't have when we went in. Actually, it's worse than that. In a general situation, I hate sending older people to acute hospitals. They always come out worse always come out worse. Now, I'm not going to get into the bu business of how they come out no longer being mobile, no longer being continent, no longer being able to stretch, no longer being able to do all sorts, balance and do all sorts of other things, but they come out with an infection. It's reckoned in North America that 100,000 people a year die because of this. The chances are that maybe 50,000 of these are due to inadequate hand hygiene, but that's a bit of a guess. Um, it's not a very well-supported number, but it's a big number, 1,000 a week, right? So some technology here. I left the cover off this, but this is a very inexpensive technology that we developed that we've now just finished a 12-month trial to see that it's sustainable <coughs> on a 50-bed unit, and we doubled hand hygiene in a unit that was already reporting 80% hand hygiene. So that's interesting, isn't it? Um, <laughs> One of my messages is don't believe the statistics that are reported publicly about hand hygiene. They're reported by people who are watching and auditing. And it's pretty obvious when they're watching and auditing. And also, um, their salaries are often dependent on increasing hand hygiene. Um, but it's doubled it. And in fact, in, in, some, in, in, in other ways, it's more than trebled and quadrupled um, the effectiveness of the hand hygiene. So what do we do? There's a lot of technologies out there that are quite expensive for this purpose. What is the purpose? The purpose is that when you go into a room, you should have your hands clean so that you're not taking an infection from somewhere else into that patient. And when you leave, you should clean your hands so that you're not taking an infection from that patient to someone else. Those are the two main events. There are a couple other events. If you're dealing with a wound, you wash your hands. If you're touching blood or something, you wash your hands afterwards. But the main thing is addressing taking an infection into the patient site and removing an infection from the patient site. So you'd, you might think, well, this is just, you know, this must be lazy staff, lazy nurses. It's not. When you're a caregiver, a good caregiver, operating in a busy environment, you could expect to cleanse your hands about 100, 120 times in a shift. If you assume that takes you 30 seconds, that's an hour of an eight-hour shift done nothing but rubbing your hands with alcohol gel. It is not a trivial issue. It is not like remembering to wash your hands before lunch. It is a, a situation where everyone's clamoring for your attention, um, and you forget. I forget. Even when I'm demonstrating this stuff, I forget. You forget. You also have situations where someone's pooped their bed. And you go out there, and you take the bed sheets off, and you walk out of the room. You're supposed to cleanse your hands as you walk out of the room. You put them on the floor, cleanse your hands, and pick them up again. There's a lot of complications to this. So this badge is very, very simple. It, all of the intelligence is in the badge. And what happens is that as you go, under a doorway into an area or under any boundary that we like to define, there's a set of light-emitting diodes. They're infrared, so you don't see them. They're sending a coded message that is sending, that's saying, you're just crossing this boundary. 
very inexpensive technology in the badge detects the time that you cross the boundary, where the boundary is, and then it causes your badge to vibrate if you haven't washed your hands subtly. It does not embarrass you. It does not yell. It does not display red bells and lights and things. It does it quietly. You then are prompted to go over and wash your hands, and all the hand wash machines everywhere, and in this particular unit, there's nearly 100 of them, they all emit a little signal, which it also clocks, so it knows you've done it. And then it glows green. So everyone knows it glows green. So, of course, the infamous doctor comes in and walks up to the patient, walks up to you, and you say, excuse me, doctor, but your badge isn't glowing green. Damn it! Damn it! These, these things never work, you know. It goes off, washes his hands, and it comes back glowing green. So it, it works sort of in a social context really well. Of course, I can't talk about growing older without the topic of falls. And everyone knows someone who has fallen over and broken a hip. And again, raise your hands if you know someone who's close to your family who's fallen over and broken a hip. Hold your hands very high. Now look around at each other, more than half the room. Now put your hands down. Now raise your hand if any one of those people that you know, or if, if the person that you raised your hand about, ever returned to normal mobility again. One. Yeah, there's always one hand that goes up. 40% of people <laughs> die within a year after this. So falling is not trivial. Um, not trivial. It is the end of your independence very often. So we want to stop this common problem that affects all of us, puts all of us at risk. So a quarter of the deaths and serious injuries are on stairs. I mean, there's a lot of falls topics I can talk about, but this is one that I'm focused on a lot at the moment. Some of them are on the level where you lose the ability to maintain your center of mass within your base of support and your go over. And of course, in Toronto, on ice. Actually, in a lot of North America, on ice. In Canada, for 150 days of the year, uh, most years, the ground is covered with snow and ice. And we forget about that. It has a huge effect. Winter has a huge effect on growing old and on disability. It really does limit our mobility. So stair falls. A study in the UK involving visiting people in their own homes and asking them what they're worried about most of all came up with, perhaps at first, a surprising result. It wasn't their health care, and it wasn't their finances. It was their stairs. They were thinking about moving in Britain into a bungalow, in Toronto into a condominium, wherever, in somewhere where they could get rid of stairs. A drastic, drastic thing to have happen in your life at that stage, to divorce yourself from your community and start again. <laughs> Deaths from stair falls are increasing. It's a bit of a crisis. In the United States, it's at 6% a year. We believe in Canada it might be a little higher than that even. In Canada, it's costing us a million dollars an hour, so in US, multiply that by 10, and then multiply it by an inflation factor of three for your healthcare system, and you've got, what have you got? 10, 30 million hours, uh, dollars an hour, right? Interesting study in the UK, complicated graph, but if you look at the top left, the swarm of bees represents the height on the vertical scale of steps on a stairway and the depth of the step on the horizontal scale. So they went out and measured over 2,000 stairs, and these were the, the range of step characteristics. Then went and asked them in the right-hand graph there, how many accidents have you had of a serious nature uh, involving death or a serious hospitalization? And look at this, a six-fold decrease in accidents as you increase the depth of the step for going. Six-fold. So by making the step deeper, is a huge difference that you can make. So if you want low-hanging fruit, let's make all of our steps deeper. Jeff, uh, which is uh, depth now? Uh, it's okay. Which dimension is that? Is that depth, depth horizontal is or vertical? Horizontal. 
the, the technical word, is it me that's buzzing? Oh yes, a bit buzz video, okay. So there you can see we're adjusting the depth. The, it's called the going or the run, technically. Um, the rise is the height. The run is the horizontal distance between any two corresponding points on a step, for one step. So you see there, in a hurry, we're doing some, some studies because we get a chance once in every five years in Canada to change the Canada building code. If you want a really difficult job to do, try and change a building code. Certainly in our country, it's taken 25 years to attempt to get this on the radar screen, and although the solution is probably obvious, we're having to hit people over the head with the empirical data. So we can do a lot with technology with changing codes. And it turns out, if you can change, if you can increase that depth of the step, you can change the accident rate, serious accident rate, by, it seems, by a factor of at least five. Huge. So here we have three common riser heights and a quick method of changing the run so that we can test all the runs for all riser heights, essentially, so that we can get the evidence in. And we do these biomechanical analyses to show how close you are to overstepping. OK. So let's quickly move on, because independence, mobility, and freedom, um, a couple of quick things. Um, independent mobility. Uh, one of the things that I've always wanted to do is to develop a Lego kit so you could convert a house when someone comes home uh, without any expense and without uh, screwing things to the wall very quickly convert it to your own need. So we've been doing that. This kit is coming onto the market next year. It's not quite like this. I can't show you the latest version, but it all snaps together. So you, you, the verticals compress between the floor and the ceiling, and the horizontals allow you to put a handrail, for example, from the bed around to the toilet, or exercise bars anywhere, and quickly snap everything together. It'll be called the kit. I'm going to go over that to this one. This is winter, independent mobility in winter. This is Bonnie and I and our dog Sooty going out for a walk. It's lovely. A key thing, another key technology, I don't know whether you've thought about it, is the footwear that you buy. Now, this happened to be top-of-the-line boots that came into our lab for testing, along with a whole range of other boots. It was advertised as the best boot by this particular company. Um, it was very expensive. Um, it looks very aggressive, a very aggressive tread super color, and it has a name I can't tell you, but it's advertised as being the boot to walk to the North Pole with. <laughs> so you cannot tell by the look of a shoe whether that's the shoe you should get for the winter. This one, you can't stand on level ice. On two degrees of ice, you just slide off sideways. So we need to do something about footwear don't we, in order to be independently mobile. This is one of our payloads in our simulation capability that many of you have seen, and that's winter with ice on the floor. So I'm gonna um, start up here's the, the control things. room, and um, we're able to lift that winter lab onto this motion base. We're able to create any conditions we like with wind and snow, and we're able to create a hill of any degree. And some of the first results are coming out, and they are startling. Hang on, let's just go back. Look at this. In this range of four shoes that we just looked at, and I'm not going to get into which shoe is which, um, you'll notice that most of them are giving way at about five degrees of slope, some of that three, and they're good shoes. They're winter shoes and winter boots. One of them makes 20 degrees. One of them can go up and down 20 degrees. And you know that one didn't have a tread on it at all. Completely flat. And we're talking about going up and down a significant slope. So watch. Here we have, a t here we have one that did six degrees. You've got to tilt your head because the camera's moved with the space. So he's going downhill. All of these, if you took them one degree further, they would fail. So it, the repeatability, you saw the, the bars, the, the, the error bars, very tight, 
very, very tight, very reproducible. But look at this next one. There's a real future for doing something with better footwear in the winter. This is going up and down a 20 degree slope. 20 degrees of ice. So we can do some things with some very simple technology. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about distracted walking, but not much because I want to move on quickly. But um, as we, we all face a problem of do, trying to do multiple things at the same time, and our brain is not very good at dividing our attention between different activities. For example, if our hearing diminishes, we are more likely to fall. Why is that? One of the things, one of the possibilities is that we're devoting more of our brain volume to understanding, try, trying to interpret the auditory environment. And there's a fair bit of evidence for that. So one of the things we want to do, and we're working on, is developing hearing aids that instead of amplifying everything, will just amplify who you're looking at. So this is perfectly feasible, and there's lots of places working on it, but I could listen to you, sir, and just listen to you to the exclusion of those. I could maybe screw my forehead up and narrow in on you, maybe relax back. I can make a lot of money on the side because we can sell one to the CIA, which listens at 45 degrees to what you're looking at. Um, <laughs> that will really confuse people. But, um, but will that cause more people to fall over? Will that cause more accidents? What will happen? So in this environment, you can walk through virtual Toronto, very realistic Toronto, you can encounter pedestrians and traffic. We can change the traffic density. And, and it's the first simulator in the world that has a very precise soundscape accompanying it. So what else do we worry about as we get older with technology? What about taking your license away to drive a car? How many of you have faced this issue with your parents? Raise your hands high. <laughs> Look, see? It's not a few hands. It's a lot of hands, right? I went over to see my mum in England a week ago, and I'm going back at Christmas, and I arrived late at the station, the train station. She gave me a lift for two miles home, and it was scary. She cannot drive in the dark. Um, a lot of people, the first thing that happens is they can't drive as the light gets poorer. She's 86 now. She can drive as if it's bright. She can drive around the local streets. I wouldn't want her on, an, on a highway, major highway. So do we take the license away from my mum? If you don't have the ability to drive and you can't walk so far, particularly in winter, what are you going to do to get your food? So you got to, I mean, a car becomes more important as you grow older, not less important as you grow older. You need it. So can we develop a scheme where we can have customized driving licenses where, if necessary, supported by, um, by, public te by official testing, but also by voluntary uh, means, people could curtail their driving, restrict it to the, the conditions that they're safe in, rather than take away the license? Because at the moment, doctor's office testing has no relationship whatsoever, it seems, in the literature to the accident rate. And on the road driving doesn't either. Because on the road driving, you're never put out there in a challenging circumstance of nighttime, snow, rain. No one goes in front and throws a dead tire on the road. No cat. You know, you just don't get a realistic challenge. So we're building uh, a, a fourth payload at the moment for our simulator, which is a driving payload. So we can study this, and it's a bit of a challenge because there is a dirty little secret about driving simulators. Many of them make 70% of their people ill. So we are determined, of course, that that won't happen. And it turns out that um, if you have a really poor driving simulator in general, but this is a very general statement, you don't get sick. If you have a driving simulator that envelops you but isn't quite right with the timing and stuff, you get very sick. And if you get a driving simulator that's really, really good, 
then you get as sick as if you were in a really, really good car. I mean, a real car, not a good car. Good, a real car, right? So um, it needs to be a very valid experience. We want to do this so that ultimately we can develop driving simulations that will allow people to work out for themselves what their limitations are so you can say, hey, look, you nearly hit that person. And they say, oh, I didn't. Well, let's replay it. Also, a driving examiner can do it. Now, we're not going to be able to afford one of the sophistication we're building here, but we're building one where we can turn off features so we can work out what's necessary to give us a valid and reliable result and not make us ill. What sort of things does this driving simulator have to have? Well, apart from moving around and turning and so that you don't just rotate the scenery in front, you rotate the car, which is one of the reasons why people get sick in some driving simulators, it's got to be a real experience. So when you go driving, you encounter rain, you encounter glare, um, a lot of real situations that driving simulators just don't meet. So or let me just let this run on a minute, because you'll see some experiments that we're doing um, to reproduce this. When you go in our driving simulator, you won't just see a spot on the screen for a glaring headlight, because that's not glare. A robot will bring headlights at you. Um, also, a, micro a series of micro valves injects rain onto your windshield. And and in certain conditions, chocolate milk. Because chocolate milk gives you a very wintry experience. So finally, let's talk about something else that's relevant to our independence. And that is the, that we don't just have to focus the technology on the person <laughs> of concern. The, person who's growing older. We have to focus it on the caregiver. And by far the biggest labor force in healthcare in both countries is the family now. The family is taking on more and more responsibility. It's taking on heavier and heavier care. And it's very stressful. In our province, 27% of families have been providing continuous care for the last two years to a loved one. The daughters of families have been giving up their careers. Kids have generally, in support of their parents, have been financially deprived, have been socially deprived. Spouses have been sick because of the stress, the, the psychological stress and the physical stress of caring for someone. It is huge. Technology must focus on caregivers. Um, I'll just, just give a plug to Alex Mihalidis in the, in the audience, and then I'll move on. Some of this technology, uh, the opportunities are for electronics and artificial intelligence and communication, remote measurement of physiologic parameters, remote measurement of activity levels. This particular system of Alex as detects when someone's fallen over and talks to them. They don't have to be wearing a badge or anything. Talks to them and decides what, together with them whether they need help and what help. But on my side of the fence, I'm very concerned about this graph. If you're a mother in Canada and your daughter says, I want, because it's usually a daughter, I think I'm taking up a career in caregiving, you should persuade her to go into mining. Because the <laughs> occupational health risk for back injuries, musculoskeletal injuries, is a third that of caregiving. The problem is um, lifting and moving people. One of the difficulties is that with all of the attempts, all of the devices for lifting and moving people, you've got to get something under the person in order to lift and move them. So we came up with an invention which has taken us a few years of testing, um, but which is coming on the market next year. And this allows us to inject a under them. So we just shoot and it goes under. That goes under. Notice there's no friction in doing it. Let's just turn the volume down there a bit. We can pull 
we can pull it out afterwards with no real effort at all. After we've used the strap or multiple straps, we can pull it out and all that happens is it turns inside out with no friction at all and pops out. So we now have systems that um, emergency workers can use and they just hit a canister on the road and it goes under people. You can use it home to lift out of a wheelchair or whatever with no stress. That's fun. And this doesn't seem to be a weight limit. This was me piling three people on top of each other. Um, we, we still have this ambition to lift a whale off a beach. We haven't had the chance to demonstrate that. We have had a student working with cows, and it's been a failure, because every time they inject under the cows, they get up and walk away. <laughs> My oh, penultimate slide is this one. This is a challenge. The, I want us to be careful that the technology that we focus on is not just information technology, is not just web-based technology, is not just artificial intelligence. All of these things are important, but we also got to focus on the nitty-gritty problems that people face. One of the big areas is small bathrooms. Bathrooms, certainly where we are, are often very small. They're like little corridors. And people try to hide the toilet, it seems, behind the cabinets. You go past the, the wash basin, as in this case, if you look at the top right, the aerial view, the toilet is tucked between the wash basin and the bathtub. So dads come home, and mum, or in this case, a home care worker, who's experienced, it still is, look at the posture she's getting into, has to somehow get dad up off the toilet bending over first to clean his bum and then pull him up. It is a disaster. It is an absolute disaster. And if you can't do this, you can't, you're probably not going to stay at home, right? And you get halfway and they both fall into the bathtub or something. The, 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 the postures here are ridiculous. So you say, well, you know, put an overhead patient lift in the bathroom. Well, um, yeah, OK. We've got to have a track in the bathroom. That's not so easy in many of these places. There's, there's a financial thing. But you've still got to manage getting the person in and out. If you've got to manage, they're in the sling, and they're going into a toilet and a bathtub and stuff. This is a super challenge. Things are not difficult because of the complexity of the technology that cut results. They're difficult to solve because of the complexity of the problem that you're trying to solve. So we must not be seduced into funding and supporting only high-tech, complex research. We have to support research and product development in areas where the technology may end up, hopefully, will end up being relatively simple, but the problem is extremely complex, <coughs> extremely complex. How do you wash someone's feet and still support them so they don't fall out of the bathtub? Look at that bottom right-hand posture there. Leaning over, supporting the subject, washing their feet. How do you do that? OK, so that's it. Two themes, prevention and independence and freedom, and some of the team that I have working on it. Thank you very much.